And it is another episode of Unpublic with Citizen Stewart today. I want to talk about advocacy in education, uh, what it really takes to win for kids. Um, we Our guest this morning is somebody who's uniquely qualified to help us understand that question. It is Mark Porter McGee, the CEO and founder of 50CAN, a national network of um, advocate, advocates and, and um, advocacies, I was going to say, um, that win policy battles for children. Um, they also win in coordinating, coalition building. They do consulting around how to win and how to win um, uh, not just elections, but lobbying, what should lobbying look like. They also put out a lot of good information and I think information is key, it's king. It's the thing that uh, advocacy and activism lacks. Um, Mark, you may have heard me say it before, but I'm going to say it again because, number one, it always drives my team crazy. The word that I coined is infovism, um, and it is because uh, at Brightbeam, the organiz organization that I run, um, we've come to see over time that we get we have, we have an input and an output. Our input is a lots of reports that we get from uh, friends and partners and allies in the field who do lots of expensive research. Um, and it's great information. And at the same time, our output is activism. We work with people on the ground who we oftentimes think could benefit from having more of that information translated for them, like put into a way where it can be actionable. Um, sometimes we get reports from friends and partners in, in ed world, education world, where we're not quite sure what's supposed to happen with it. So we have to go over it a few times and then figure out where's the action in this. Like, what's the thing that, like, it's great information, but now how does it make the world a different place? Um, so that's my infovism push is like, if you have people who are great with information with no action, that's not great. And if you have people who are always acting, but not on the best information, that's also not great. Like uh, ill-informed activism will kill the world. So I don't know how you feel about that. Mm -hmm. um, bringing you in, Mark. Uh, good yeah, morning. Yeah. Good morning. Well, thanks for thanks for having me. I've been a fan of the show, and I've been looking forward to coming on. So thanks for making. Well, time. I appreciate um, all that you do. You you play a very special role in uh, in Edworld. I think. And number one, you're a calm, sage, um, analytical, and philosophical person with a deep curiosity that uh, produces an interesting Twitter feed <laughs> and an interesting feed in general, just the, the, the Mark feed in general is awesome. One yeah. of the things that you had put out, so you've written several uh, books that I thought were, or reports are books that I thought were useful, informative, and in the pre presentation in them is pristine, like just amazing. But um, in 2019, you had written something that I thought was a good guide for the field. And I just don't think the field has yet fully done enough with it, but it's the little, a little opposition is a good thing and other lessons from the science of advocacy. So for people watching, you can find this on 50 Ken's website. Um, actually, I just wanna make sure that I'm understanding the background just a little bit right and everything. So Mark, this comes out of 10 years of you having experiences in your organization, having experiences in policy and on the ground and you wanting to share what the learnings from that. Is that the, the proper origin yeah, story? I think that's right. I mean, it, it comes from just maybe some curiosity about, this is the work we do every day. So, um, you know, I, I got my start after grad school. So I'm sort of a recovering sociologist. So, <laughs> <laughs> so after grad school, after getting my PhD in sociology, I went and worked at think tanks in DC. And then I, I got the chance to work on the ground uh, starting in 2005 on, on education advocacy campaigns. So I've always kind of been curious about like, how does this work? And always kind of thought of myself as like an eager student of advocacy. And um, part, of the, part of the reason I wanted to create 50CAN was this idea that we could have lots of local campaigns learning from each other. So after, doing that for almost 10 years of connecting these campaigns together, it felt like it would be good to pause and say like, what have we actually learned from this? And you know, how can we ask some questions? And one thing that I realized was there's a lot we could do looking at our own data. And we have one report that looks just at 50 cans data, but also there is this whole world of people, you know, like you were saying at the top of the show, who there's all this information out there. Um, there's really smart social scientists that have studied advocacy 
but I wasn't reading a lot of their work and I kind of figured, well, if I'm not reading it, maybe other people aren't either. So I just sort of took the time, read the literature, tried to synthesize it, bring it down into lessons. So that the idea is like filtering the academic research through the lens of what is actually useful to people who do advocacy every day. That was the idea behind it. You're gonna see uh, Toya Algren's name pop up in the comments uh, several times. She is a 50 can alumna. Uh, and she's here to let you know it. <laughs> and she's with us every morning. Um, did you face any issue when you were doing the research part of things that wasn't the 50 can data that was really just more looking at the philosophy of, of organizing and not just philosophy, but the sociology, you know, you know, everything of organizing that much of that wasn't around education and there may have been a disconnect. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing is there is a lot of data out there, but there's not a lot of specific data that that about the, our world. So that is a bit of a, a tension. So if you look at the literature on advocacy, there's very little that that is on education campaigns. And so what I try to do is is kind of embrace that and say, like, it's useful to look at advocacy from all different sorts of perspectives. Let's see what the general principles are that seem to be common across campaigns. Mm. And then let's ask ourselves questions. You know, I, I think it would be a mistake to ever take any of these lessons and just say like, this is this is it. But it sort of it it helps you ask better questions about your own work and and um, and then kind of bring it into your own world. You know, I never really see from you anything that says, uh, guys, we're getting it wrong. Like I always see for you, like a from you, like a intellectual curiosity about what's going the right direction or mm -hmm. how to go the right direction. But the field honestly does have a lot of pieces throughout the year of, I told you guys that Common Core wouldn't work. And here's why. I told you guys that, you know, the, the teacher evaluation thing wouldn't work. And here's why. So there's a lot of like retro looking, um, but yeah. you seem to produce a more forward looking. Is that because you don't think we're getting a lot of stuff wrong? Or is it just, yeah. you just don't think that there's a lot to, a lot of, I don't know, what, why? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I do try to connect whatever, you know, whatever kind of like research we're doing on the advocacy lab side, um, which which I should say is this a partnership with Future Ed at Georgetown. So it's sort of this collaborative project where we try to put on our academic hats uh, sometimes. I try to connect <laughs> that with the questions we're asking, uh, which are, you know, are forward looking, right? So like every year, 50 cans campaigns are running local campaigns and these specific policy goals. So we're always kind of looking forward. I think it would be, in, I do think you could say, I mean, ed reform is funny because there is a fair bit of hand wringing, but I don't know if there's a lot of analysis. Uh, hmm. So it would be interesting to have a conversation, you know, with those of us who worked on teacher eval or common core and, and try to figure out what went wrong. I have, I have some thoughts on it. I'm sure a lot of people do. Well, I'm interested in it just because number one, there's always a sense that we got things wrong when, you know, I don't know how to say it, but sometimes you lose and it's not because you got everything wrong. It's just because you lost. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was a game to lose. And of course, every, in every game, you're going to make some plays that are bad plays and some that are great plays or good plays. But if you sit around and beat yourself up that, you know, the reason that we lost is because we had it all wrong. And we were so arrogant and we then those narratives start taking shape and you haven't really studied them well enough to know. I mean, teacher eval was just a, an amazingly hard push period. It was going to be anybody who would have went into that thinking, oh, yeah, you know, we're going to just put a bunch of money behind us and we're going to win. So I wonder sometimes if we don't need more of what you just said, stop, uh, do some analysis, double check your analysis and be a little bit sober about it. You know, um, I just don't I know if we're doing that. Yeah, I think like one critique I would have of Teacher Eval and, and Common Core is it felt like it was nowhere on the map. No one was talking about it. And then everyone was talking about it. And at the same time, everyone was talking about it. There were a bunch of bills moving and mm. there was, wasn't a lot of room to think about it. And then um, when things went wrong, I think people kind of got into panic mode. So it it uh, it did feel like an environment where you weren't you weren't probably going to make your best choices. Um, yeah. But you know, to your point too, I, I think the worst lesson we could take from any loss is like, oh, this, it's not change isn't possible, or this never works, or 
Uh, I think that's actually the only thing we know for sure is wrong. Uh, I'm pretty confident like advocacy can work uh, and, and some ed policies can make kids' lives better. And so that's something to build on. Yeah, I think um, the, the, as a person who I consider myself to be on the outside, who's just really deeply interested, doesn't see the internal battles, doesn't see it from the inside as much. I just always wonder when I'm listening through all the noise, was it the right thing? Not did you play it wrong? So when I, Common Core is a good example where I hear people say oftentimes about how it was done. But uh, the question still sits for me, like, is it important for there to be common standards across states? That's my question. Like, uh, my question right. isn't, did you do it the wrong way? Or did you communicate it the wrong way? Or did you not talk to the right people? All that can be true. And still, I would wonder, is it a good thing to have, um, you know, common standards across? Have we lost that battle, Mart? I mean, like, even the thought of that, like. The idea of policy or common core and standards. Com well, just having common standards across states, whether you call it common core yeah. or whether you call it a burger, but like it just. Yeah, it's funny because I'm. I mean, now I think most people who know common core know it through like Trump, you know, on the campaign trail using it as a punching bag or or seeping into popular culture. Like I don't understand my kids' math homework. Mm -hmm. I think it is it is helpful. It's almost like when you're a historian, one of the things you're supposed to do is try to put yourself in the mind of the people who were making the decisions at the time. So that shouldn't, we were there. So I, the logic of it, I think made sense, like you were saying. So uh, state, sta the way the US education system works is it puts a lot of, um, puts a lot of onus on standards at the state level. Like mm -hmm. a lot of other countries just have curriculum. So they standardize curriculum, that's the actual lessons being taught. At the US we have this like abstracted layer of standards. Those are the things you're trying to teach too you can use different curriculum to get there. Uh, and so when people looked at standards, they said, well, they vary a lot across states, but also they're of varying quality. And if you're, if you're not setting the bar high enough for kids, then even when they hit the standard, they're behind. That, that was the logic. I think that makes sense. Um, and I think it's still, you know, it's still a little bit to be determined what, what happened after we made these standards more rigorous, obviously there was a political backlash. Morgan Polakoff, the professor, has a um, book coming out where I think he makes the argument in focusing so much, I haven't read it yet, but just sort of seeing how he summarized it, in focusing so much on standards, perhaps we lost the battle over curriculum and maybe we should have focused more there. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, we have a very decentralized yeah. education system. So I think the one of the bigger problems is you're never gonna be able to pull a lever at the federal or state level that will make all the difference. If you don't have local work going on, it's probably gonna come up short. That's my lesson. So um, um, a person you know very well, uh, Kathleen Porter McGee, uh, actually wrote something a long time ago that has stuck with me and I've used multiple times later because I didn't know it. It was just like a history of school reform in Finland. And uh, I had been getting beat up with Finland in a lot of discussions. People were just using Finland to beat me over the head with. Well, in Finland, it's it's kind of like you know an American Pie with the you know that one time at band camp. Well, that's mm -hmm. what Finland was. Well, you know, in Finland, um, and it'd be like they look, they respect teachers and they they don't have standardized tests. And so it you know I I read Kathleen's piece on that, which basically said, yeah, this is how they got to where they are. Um, in terms of how they do policy. And they went through a reform phase where they did some pretty rigorous things. And I thought to myself, those are all things we would never be able to do in the United States because we yeah. love freedom too much. We, we're not going to go close all of our, our teacher colleges and let the centralized government take over what it takes Absolutely. to become a teacher. We're not going to do yeah. that, right? Yeah. Um, we're not going to nationalize curriculum. Um, no. No. Yeah, I, I think that's, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that a lot of times the mindset of the conversation is like, let's just copy what other countries are doing. If they, you know, Finland has high test scores on PISA, what do they do? I think that America is a pretty unique system. Um, I mean, we're a really big country for one thing. Oftentimes we compare ourselves against small countries. <laughs> we're diverse, yeah. we're decentralized. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot about America that's different. So I, I do think we always have to pause and say like, well, how would it work in the American <laughs> education system? Uh, we're never gonna have, I don't think we're ever gonna have a national curriculum. Um, national testing, national curriculum, national standards, none of that. You wouldn't see that happening, no. Can't imagine that happening, no. Um, 
so when you think about that then cuz you know me I push choice a lot as the as the backstop against being assigned to something that you don't want if everything's going to be you know if there're going to be no standards and there's going to be no unified way of knowing whether or not what you're doing is right and whatever it's just going to be kind of like the wild wild west now I need choice like as my only doesn't mean it's going to be perfect it just means that um that that feels like that's the backstop of a wild, wild west system of education. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think that's a pretty good way of thinking about it. Like if we can't, you have to have some kind of accountability. If it's not gonna be top down, like if that's not politically viable, then it needs to be bottom up. You need to have some mechanism where kids and families can make decisions and apply some pressure based on what they're seeing. So I, I think you've seen over the last five years, as some of these top-down reforms have stalled out, you've seen more pressure and more interest in, in bottom-up accountability. Mm. Yeah, I'm waiting to see what that's going to look like. I mean, the bottom-up to me is where it gets messy in terms of advocacy and activism, because on the ground, there are all these other forces that have foot soldiers that um, I've used the military metaphor before it, that that education reform was very much like the Air Force, and they drop leaflets from the skies hoping that they would hit state capitals, but there were ground forces that would pick up those leaflets before they even got to the people they were supposed to get to and just collect them all. And so we're, we're fighting with an Air Force, the other team is fighting with an Army, Marines, Coast Guard, um, Special Forces, um, you know, the, the, the elite ground forces that can go into the Capitol and scare people out of passing certain bills or whatnot. And every, every form was very happy with its Air Force. For, for all those years and eventually started saying, okay, now we got to get some ground troops, which is now where you're starting right. to see, you know, more of that. I don't know if you would agree with that analysis, but. Um, yeah, uh, I, think that, I think that's right. So like when I started in, uh, in, in sort of the policy world in 2001, I was working at the Progressive Policy Institute and um, Andy Rotherham was there and, and Sarah Mead and my wife and, and they were working on, on education policy. And I think we all that we all kind of understood like you can create some ideas nationally, but ultimately this has to be driven at the state level. And at that time, there wasn't that much philanthropic investment mm. at the state level. Mm -hmm. So I think what you've seen over time, and and this is one of the things that's that's gotten stronger in in ed reform is you've seen more attention to local groups. Um, the but the scale of the problem is so big like the and you have so many school districts so many different battles um that that's part of the challenge of it but i think what we've seen is that you know to your analogy there's sort of a last mile problem in ed reform you actually if you actually want to change policy you actually have to be in state capitals if you care about mm -hmm. state mm -hmm. policy you need to actually be there lobbying if you really want to have more power in the hands of parents, you actually have to talk to parents and work with parents. And, um, and that, that work takes a long time. You can't, um, you can't just drop in. And I think a lot of what you saw in the early phase of ed reform is if a, a, you know, a debate heated up in a state, then some people from DC would fly in and testify and then leave. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the stakeholder groups are always there. Mm -hmm. um, year round. And, and that gives them a lot of power. Yeah. I think, uh, um, what do you, so when you say the last mile problem though, say a little bit more about that. I mean, what do you so say? What is I the think, last mile problem? Yeah. I think people use that, you know, in, in various kind of ways, but like in a, in a, like a business, uh, analysis, like you could have all these like really fast internet, uh, um, you know, sites, but if the wire that actually goes into your home isn't fast, then you, 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 you may have experienced this problem. Uh, uh, yes, you know, I have experienced this problem. Okay, that, that makes sense. That kind of thing. So it's the same thing in, yeah. in ed reform. Like we, we could have the most sophisticated policy reports in the world, but to your point earlier, if no one's translating that into a one pager and actually walking it into the education, you know, committee chair's office, uh, it, it probably isn't going to turn into policy. Yeah. So let's um, let's back up and connect a little bit from the report that I mentioned at the top of the hour for um, for everybody listening. Um, let me go back to what this report is called. Um, and you can find it on uh, uh, um, 
on um, 50 Can's website. It's called A Little Opposition is a Good Thing and Other Lessons from the Science of Advocacy. This was from October 2019. You can find it on the, on the site. It was a joint um, report with Tom Tock from Future Ed. Um, and I found this interesting because it hit all my buttons just on, can we think scientifically about the work that we're doing? Can we have an approach that is based on information? A lot of activism is raw and, and, um, and passionate and uh, all things that are great in terms of making social change. At the same time, a little analysis isn't gonna kill anybody to be able to understand how to be more effective and how to get things done. There were four things um, early on in the report that um, that kind of are headlines in the report. One of them is the hardest changes to secure are the modest ones. This is a natural friction to, to policy change, like trying to push an object across a table. Once you apply enough force to get it off its resting place, it is more likely to travel um, a foot than an inch. This feels a little bit like physics, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Mark. So, you know, you're getting extra fancy here. But what is this headline about? The, the most modest changes are the ones that sometimes are the most difficult. Yeah. So I think, you know, one thing I was kind of looking for in the literature was, was research that answered questions we ask ourselves. So a big question we ask at the beginning of a campaign is, um, what should we be aiming for? That's, a, you know, that's probably the most important decision you make is like, what are we aiming for? And I was interested in findings that were a little counterintuitive. So I think if you ask most advocates, they'd say, um, if you reduce your ambition, you're more likely to win. So if you, if you go for a small incremental goal, you're more likely to win. And what the, the research seems to suggest is the opposite, that if you pick goals that are too small, they're not worth doing. Mm. And uh, and the, the problem is one of scarcity of attention. So one of the examples we use in, in, in the report is the Postal Service Reform Act. And every year, the, there'd be a couple people in the federal government that would try to reform the Postal Service. And this is obviously before the, you know, the, the big problems of the last couple of years, but those problems were predicted. And there were ways to reform how the Postal Service works to head off a problem but it never made it through because it wasn't um, galvanizing enough attention. And so counterintuitively, it's actually helpful sometimes to have opposition if it raises the stakes and gets people talking about your issue. And then a win is much more meaningful for everyone involved. Um, and I think you've seen people embrace this in the last few years that having a controversial bill is not necessarily a bad thing if you can galvanize your supporters. And um, so we've tried to take that to heart. And as we think about our work, you know, we try to go for things that people would want to fight for, to put their time in around, and that if you actually passed would make a, you know, a real difference in people's lives. You know, right now in Minnesota, you're probably aware we have uh, what's, con what's called the Page Amendment. Um, the amendment is to amend our state constitution with a few words, just basically those words meant to guarantee a quality education for every child. Um, I thought that, that, and it's, it's within public education too. So it's not like some choice thing or whatever. I thought that was incredibly modest, like <laughs> in terms of, I was completely not, uh, I don't know what the, I, I wasn't super impressed with that as a, a big goal, the feedback on it the pushback on changing the constitution to guarantee equality, um, education for all kids has rankled all the feathers of the ed education establishment. So the teachers union, school board uh, uh, association, the people who represent um, superintendents and administrators, like you would swear that it was, it was calling for the end of public education. Um, how do you look at a scenario like that, you're going to put a lot of capital into something that changes a few words in the Constitution, and you're going to spend a year or two doing it, um, and you might still fail in doing that. How would you look at that as a uh, as a campaign or as a goal? Well, I think you know, on on one level, I think you could say if people are debating it, then that's that's a good thing because I think one of the first things you want to kind of cross the threshold of is are people paying attention. Um, mm. You know, I'm not a legal expert, so I don't, I, tracking what happens when, um, when you make changes to the Constitution is probably a little complicated. Um, I, what, I, what I like about the idea is I feel like 
sometimes we focus so much on the details of things that we lose, uh, we kind of we lose the connection with a with a common debate. And I think saying should every child have a constitutional right to a high quality education or not is probably something that people can engage with. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's a, on that front. I think that's there's real power in it. What actually happens if that passes? and how it ca kind of cascades, I think is an open question. Yeah, I think, um, so with this one that I specifically just pointed out, that is the question asking the public. The public is being asked, should should a child have a right to a, a quality, a constitutional right to a quality education? So um, what you just said is true of us right now. It is out there now. People are debating it. The news columnists are having to write about it. So, you know, it's in the world. It's out there now. And so good job. Um, so what the other side is doing is jumping past the question to the results of, oh my God, if you were to do that, it would just open the door for standardized testing to become the one way that we measure everything and whatnot. So right. the opposition has jumped to the results of the, not the question, but what happens if you say yes to that very benign question. Right. Very interesting yeah. to watch. It is. And I think that's, you know, one of, one of the other lessons in the report is about framing and we talk about framing a lot, and, and I, it's sort of appealing to think, uh, well, if I, if I talk about my issue this way, then I'll win the argument. And, and one of the things that we point out in the research is uh, it's easy to introduce a new frame. It's really hard to win a framing war. Mm. Uh, and that, so that's, uh, that, that's a big question is like, and, and one of the things that oftentimes the opposition is really good at is taking an issue where you might have a little momentum and winning the framing war over it. Mm -hmm. And that just requires a level of access to dis distribution of information and, and repetition that you don't often you don't often see on the reform side. Well, it seems like it's hard for us to win a framing war, but it seems like the opposition oftentimes wins framing wars. Why, why is that? I, I think it has something to do with message discipline. I think one of the things about ed reform is it's pretty decentralized. So I think <laughs> An understatement. I think what you yeah. might know, it, the funniest thing about ed reform is when it's described as like a conspiracy because it's yeah, <laughs> there's never a master plan. No, um, no, I think there's that, but I also think it's it, it's where the message goes. I think we end up in pretty small eco chambers, um, echo chambers sometimes. I one of the uh, one of the stories in the in the framing chapter of the report is about Martin Luther King Jr. and the work he did around framing. Mm -hmm. And tr one of the things he was doing was trying to change the stories we tell about Christianity and what it means to be a good Christian. And shifting from being a good Christian is your personal behavior that will get you into heaven to we have a responsibility as Christian Christians to right wrongs in the here and now mm -hmm. and kind of, uh, uh, a more sort of activist Christianity. And one of the arguments um, that's, that's made in one of these, these analyses is that the repetition on Sunday uh, as a reverend across a lot of different churches was a very powerful way to shift the frame. And so if you think about that, and then you think about how our messages go out, uh, you know, with a couple tweets and stuff, it's probably not surprising it doesn't land as well. You know, that's an interesting, that's a very interesting um, um, story, though. Uh, you know, in religion and in theology, you have this idea of the personal piety, which is, you know, my relationship with God gets me into heaven and whatnot. And you don't have a lot of responsibility for what the rest of the world does, because it's a personal piety between you and the the creator. And then what you just mentioned is the the more common good um, aspect of Christianity, for sure. I don't know about other religions, is that, no, you know, you are stewards of the world also. And you're supposed to walk and act in the way that Christ did with, you know, trying to make a good world. You're supposed to ask very deep questions, not like, should I help you with charity? But why are you poor in the first place, for instance, is, you know, part of our, our theology. Um, and in education world, there is this sense of if you get your own kid into a good school, your job is done. That's your personal piety. Like, listen, right. I got my kid into a suburban school. It's a great American public school. I love it. Uh, so I love public education. And you don't go the next step to ask, but why is it different for other people? Right? Like, why is this thing that I support so much um, making others poor? 
Yeah, exactly. And that's when the framing switches to a movement building, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the power of that. So, the, so that lesson is from, uh, from a sociologist named Alden Morris, who's done some really great work on, on the civil rights movement. So that, that's an example. I, I do think there's a lot of insight to mine from that research and it and it doesn't provide us all the answers but it maybe provides us a better perspective as we're trying to think about how to be more successful mm, i love that all right so moving on to another of your big headlines here and this one i think is really to me um very counterintuitive so let's jump right in <laughs> the powerful aren't as powerful as you think uh it seems logical to assume that the advocacy efforts of the powerful should succeed more often than those with less power but this isn't true when it comes to seeking a policy change, powerful groups are no more likely to win than any other group. That just completely seems counterintuitive. So tell me more about the powerful aren't as powerful as we think. Well, uh, so so there's a few ways you can track this, but in, in one of the research studies that, that we cite, they looked at um, debates in, in Washington, D.C. over several years, and they tracked the size and, and resources of the different groups, and they tracked how much money they spent on lobbying and, and the other parts of their campaigns. And they found that spending more money did not result in a higher win rate, um, which, is, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, and I think, so my takeaway is somewhat ho hopeful oftentimes we find ourselves outspent. Um, and just because the other side has more money does not mean they can freeze policy in place. Now, it is true that oftentimes the powerful are the ones defending the status quo and the less powerful are trying to change it. That is mm -hmm. harder. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is, it is easier to defend something. It's easier to stop change than to make change. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something we need to take seriously. But, um, the way you organize yourself, the tactics you choose, um, the way you create um, a narrative around your work, those tactical decisions matter more than the other side having a little more money. Um, so when you are a parent and um, you have problems with schools and schooling, you're very much by yourself. You may find some other parents that are similarly situated. So now you become smaller groups of parents having the same problem. But the next level up to the point where you have organized political power within the system to to make change for the problems you're having is seems very weak, feels very tenuous, very fragile, very weak. Um, and there are a lot of things working against you. Number one, you're only going to be a parent with kids at this age for once in your life. And so are all the other people that you're trying to organize. So you have a more transient population. The your opposition has a more um, stable um population they have foot soldiers lobbyist money budgets years and years and years and years of studying how to defeat you no matter what you look like where you come from and the parent population parent power is not uh not that well resourced and stable and and organized um it does feel like in, the, in a case like that the powerful really are they got you beat before you even come um, and I see emerging ways of which we're trying to get parents to have more power. We're trying to provide infrastructure and training. But do you think it'll ever really, do you think that tactics for them really could help them win the day? Or is it really just, they're going to be outmatched for a long period of time? Yeah, well, I do think, I think your thing about, um, which gets a little bit to the idea of persistence, right? I, I do think one of the biggest advantages oftentimes the powerful and status quo have in education is just they're going to be around for a long time and they can wait <laughs> out change yeah. that, that's a like a pretty effective tactic is yeah are you prepared to come back every year for the next six years to try to see this through and even you know oftentimes when we get something passed it'll get messed up in in uh implementation because it's hard to track that um so i think that's i think that's real on, on the other hand i would say um, I, I mean, I'm constantly surprised in our own work how often a relatively small number of people get organized and can and can push something that matters. So, um, you know, our when we tracked our win rate over um, over the past ten years, we won 49% of the time. Hmm. So, I guess it depends if you're a glass half full or half empty person. But I, I think that's pretty impressive. A lot of times, you know, my takeaway is if we had not picked something up and championed it, 
it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Um, and usually we're, we have fewer people on our side. Um, but I do think there is a threshold you need to clear. So you do need to be prepared to do something for several years. It's unlikely you're going to get the win um, right away. And there are a set of pieces that need to be put in place. And I think this is where coalitions can be powerful. It's a lot to ask of a parent to master the inside arts of lobbying or to have the money to pay for a lobbyist. Um, we should be doing a better job of where we have that capacity uh, connecting up with parent groups. Um, and, and that's something I think we're getting a little bit better at, uh, but I, I think that's one area where um, we're, uh, we're underperforming against where we could be if we work together more closely. You know, in my state, you know a little bit about Minnesota. You've seen our work here and what we're trying to accomplish over years. Um, it feels a little bit like we're living in a post-reform nihilism um, and that many of the coalitions that were there before when they had something like race to the top to unite them or teacher eval or charter schools, many of those things are gone now. So many of those battles feel like lost, number one. We And, and uh, the empire did strike back and the empire won and, uh, and the, the coalition the so-called coalition is in disarray. There is no coalition anymore. So we had tables of philanthropists and community-based organizations, nonprofits, um, parents groups that were all kind of sitting together, working together, putting heat on, um, on decision makers at all levels. And that was sustained for a period of time. It was a thing, especially in the race to the top era of like, this is the way that the world is working right now. You better get with it. This is what we're doing. Uh, and it feels like we're in Mad Max territory now where all of the like, you know, everything's burned down and the reform world is gone. And um, we're just gonna get what we get. When that happens and that settles in, all of the previous wins look like nothing. So even the, 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 the previous policy wins that there were that were put on the books still haven't made a difference for kids. Like the kids now, um, Minneapolis public schools and St. Paul public schools couldn't be in worse condition when it comes to outcomes. Like they, we talked about the achievement gap for 10, 15, 20 years, and that couldn't be worse than, than it is right now. So it does feel like nihilism has set in and the powerful have won. Um, I don't know if this is a fair question to ask you to put you on the spot to like fix the world, but do you have you seen like the ebb and the flow of you're doing really well? You're making some wins and then you take some bruising losses, but then you do come back again. Yeah, well, you know, uh, so I'll give you like a science of advocacy answer and I'll give you a uh, just sort of popular <laughs> yeah. So I like to read uh, biographies or listen to audiobooks of biographies. And I think one thing that I take away that's kind of hopeful from this is if you listen to the biographies of famous people, so I'm like listening to Walt Disney's biography right now, hmm. they, I think for most of their life, they felt like a failure. Uh, it's sort of a weird thing, right? Because we think of them as very successful. Um, but, you know, the, if you're trying to do important things, you're going to fall down a lot. And and I think that you got to be okay with that. So on some level, it's it's kind of where things end up at the at the long scope of time than, than in any given moment. So I, I try to remind myself of that. And I, I think that is true. It's just it's just hard, and we're trying to do something that's hard. Um, I would say, from a science of advocacy standpoint, they've um, we have a report that just looks at experiments, um, experiments in advocacy, and one of the things they show is that um, the most successful advocacy appeals are personal and uh, forward-looking and hopeful. Um, so, uh, so I do think even if you're not always feeling hopeful, I think the most <laughs> successful leaders are going to be hopeful. I think part of our, our power <laughs> is that there is a reality of people's personal experiences mm -hmm. um, that we need to constantly check in on, um, which is uh, a lot of families don't feel like their needs are being well met by schools. So they're going to want to they're going to want to change things. They did this experiment where they had um, field organizers go out on the street and try to recruit people for an environmental campaign. And one set of people had to give facts. So it was like, you know, let me tell you all the you know rivers that are being polluted. And the other set would tell a personal story. Like I grew up near a lake and I saw that it, it became polluted over time. We couldn't swim mm -hmm. in it. 
And the personal story was much more powerful. So I, I think we reconnect to what's actually going on in the world and then maybe try a little harder to be hopeful about the vision and, and that can that can get us through. You know, um, I like the way you think on these things. I really do appreciate the way that you think on these things. Um, and I always think that it's smart to try and learn from other areas of research, not just look at it through education lens, but, you know, urban planning has its own set of challenges that you want to win. The environmental movement has its own set of challenges. Um, you know, the marriage equality movement is one that people uh, try look to for lots of learnings. The environmental one is interesting based on what you just said. It reminded me of my, my friend here locally, Linnell Michelson, who told me one time about environmentalism, that there's the, the, you know, the earth is burning, we're all going to die environmentalism. And there's a, ooh, this is what a tomato should taste like environmentalism. And, uh, and I struggle with this one. I'd love to know like where you come down on this in that, um, for instance, achievement gap is not just a problem. It is a problem that is assigning millions of children to um, economic exile in their lives. It's a shutout of the American dream for many people. That's the the world is burning environmentalism. Like this problem isn't a, you know, it's not, there's nothing cute about this problem. It's actually um, diminishing lives, minds and lives um, of many of God's children. And, uh, and it's a shame. It's a sin. It's it, to me, and there it's, it's, it's the earth is burning. Well, yeah, yeah, the yeah. What should the tomato taste like version mm -hmm. of that? What, what, is, what would you think science would tell us about the difference between like negative advertising works in politics, um, but the whole Reagan sunny optimism thing works? Which one works more? <laughs> That's an unfair question. No, no. Uh, well, I, so I think I think. Um, So betrayal can be really powerful. So there actually are some interesting studies of what emotions people need to feel um, to get off the sidelines. So one of the most powerful emotions people can feel is feeling betrayed, particularly by their own government. Hmm. So it's, you know, it's a group, your government, local government, state government, federal government that should be helping you, should be representing you. If they're hurting you, that can make people angry enough to get off the sidelines. So I do think you uh, you need that kind of spark, but um, there's this uh, sociological literature that talks about a moral battery, which I think is kind of an interesting analogy. So basically, you know, battery works by having a positive and a negative side, and the energy flows between them. And you know, movements work in a similar way. You need positive and negative emotions, and you kind of need to pair them together. So a sense of betrayal can be a really um, you know, charging negative emotion, but you got to pair that with something else, uh, a sense of love, a sense of hope. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, to your point about what is our tomato taste good, um, we probably under invest still in showing uh, examples of when education really works for kids. And like that should be our, our moral center. Um, we we're in this work because we think that when you get a great education or even just like a great lesson, like a light goes off in your head and you see the world differently and you feel differently about yourself and maybe you're capable of, of more. Um, and that that's really powerful. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's a little harder to tell, you know, I think uh, you don't necessarily just get that from like walking through a school, but um, but I think that's why a lot of people become teachers and um, it's why a lot of parents fight so hard to get that experience for their kid because they see the difference in their kid when it works. Yeah, I wonder if, you know, a hard problem there is that if I gave 100 people a spoonful of sugar, it's going to taste the same way to 100 people. If I make 100 people eat cilantro, it's going to taste different to a lot of different people. I think in school reform, you know, like showing parents the the good school or the good learning environment is a problem because they have different ideas about what that actually is, right? For some, you know, Montessori might pull your chain and another, a very kind of back to basics, regular, rigorous school might pull your chain, you know, um, seeing uniforms might do it for you. Like, wow, you know, this is, you know, um, 
Whereas the other side is selling some some weird Disney version of a past we never had um, version of public education. That's a very Norman Rockwell painting. And I don't know how they do it. They cast a similar past vision like we all came from the same place and it works so yeah. well. I don't know how we can do that, but we should. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I do think that's a good point that, um, you know, I think we've come to the conclusion maybe this wasn't always true in every you know every ed reform book that was ever written but basically we've come to the conclusion that if we're gonna have universal excellence in education it's going to have to require different kinds of education for different kids there's going to have to be a level of personalization to get everyone to their kind of like maximum potential and that is inherently already kind of a complex idea than just there's this one school if everyone does it this one way everyone will be you know well taken care of mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but that said i do think we live in a world of customization so there, there should be some way to bridge out of that right like i don't i don't go on netflix because i'm convinced there's one show that everyone's watching that i should watch but they mm -hmm. kind of serve me up things i might want to see and um that makes i think a certain intuitive sense right um and that is the power of choice. I think the hard thing, the really hard thing about choice in education is there's a lot of friction to education. Mm -hmm. So you don't actually wanna be constantly changing schools. There's a lot that goes into the community and the friend networks and that sort of thing. Um, and so somehow we've gotta figure out a way to introduce more opportunities to find that thing that, that really works for your child. And that's where I think there's a lot of power as we think about this recovery with all this money coming in to say, we're not just going to put it all into default schools, mm -hmm. but we're going to create options after school. We're going to create ways where pa parents can make more choices with tutoring, with summer camp. I think the more you can introduce that, um, the more opportunities you have to find the thing that works for your kid. Yeah. I think choice is really hard for a lot of people. Um, you just mentioned Netflix. There's people that don't like to flip through a uh, hundred different possibility shows and then pick one. As a matter of fact, for many people, a, a few seconds into that is really annoying. Mm -hmm. It's really annoying to not just have something pop up. Um, now, me growing up, we didn't really have that problem because you had four channels <laughs> right. and, and whatever was on was on and you just lived with it. Um, I have a Kindle now that has thousands of books in it. And uh, there's times when uh, I have a little bit, it, there's been research around this. I'm not gonna articulate it well right now, but there's been research around choice fatigue. Um, so it can be a very powerful negative image to people to tell them that the things that are so solid and stable in their life right now are gonna, you're gonna have all these choices. And for me, that sounds great. But for some people that feels like a nightmare waiting to happen. Um, yeah, I, I, don't I mean, know I think if you would agree, but experience where you're happy to find some show you like, yeah. and then you just don't want it to run out, right? Because then you have to choose again. That's so why people I, binge. I respect that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, uh, um, and this is also, I think, why K-8s are um, really popular with certain sets of parents is because they don't want to make a middle school decision. Right. Let me put the kid in at kindergarten, in some cases, K-12s, you know, like some private schools. Let me make one decision, get you in there and be done. Yeah, I, so I think that's right. And I, so I think that somehow we need to find a way where it we make it easier for parents to find a school that works for their child. And then I think we shouldn't expect them to then keep exercising a choice on that school, for example. Mm -hmm. The goal is to find something that works and, and stick with it uh, a lot of the time. Um, so that I think that sort of taking that more seriously, like what does that actually look like? Um, mm -hmm. And also, I think we'd all, it would be harder if Netflix, to stay with that analogy, like you you found a show you liked and then you went into a lottery to decide. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you get to see it. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Just, um, five. Yeah. You get into <laughs> um, All right. Well, let's jump to another headline because there's just two more, but I want to make sure we have time. Uh, um, so the next big headline to me, another one that uh, feels a little personal to me, like you wrote it about me. Um, um, but number three is the most effective lobbying doesn't look like lobbying. Arm twisting, raised voices, or threats rarely get results. Instead, most change happens when policymakers and outside advocates see themselves as members of the same team. Um, 
I've seen this in the Capitol where um, advocates and a lawmaker or decision maker are really working together over time. And it's a little back and forth. Listen, you know, if you take this out or you put this in, you know, this might be a little bit more, you know, easy to work with and, you know, balancing out. But help me with the arm twisting, raised voices uh, and all that stuff, which in some ways feels like activism, you know. It, yeah. You know, <laughs> there's a professor, um, Beth Leach, she studies uh, lobbying. So she follows lobbyists around and, um, and, and written a couple books on lobbying. And she says that TV shows and movies about lobbying are always doing a detriment to people who want to be effective lobbyists. Because it's just more exciting to show, you know, you close the door and you scream at someone. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, there's a certain, the, the basic idea here is that um, someone needs to be your champion and not a reluctant champion. Um, so the first thing you want to make sure is for the people who are naturally inclined to push a bill, that, that, that you're arming them with everything they need to be effective. This is particularly important at the state and local level because you're dealing with people who don't usually have a lot of capacity. They don't have a lot of staff. So if you come and say, you know, in Connecticut, for example, we're working on a bill this year, um, Sabira Gordon, the, the ED of CONCAN, um, that is focused on kids d uh, can come with the hairstyle that works for them so that they're not being discriminated against. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly, this is important for African-American kids. Um, and um, the strategy is let's find people who get that that's important. And then, well, here's the research. Here's the, why it's a problem. Here's what the bill might look like that could solve this problem. We'll connect you with parents that, that want to talk about why it's important to them. So you kind of build, you build capacity that way. Um, and if you spent all that time, because you have a limited amount of time, if instead you spent that going to the people who don't get it and just trying to pound into them, this mm. is important, you might not get anywhere. So that, that's the idea behind it. So start with your allies, help them be effective champions. And then you got to kind of work your way through and, you know, and be persuasive. You know, on that, I'm glad you mentioned this thing about the hair. In reform world, there's a little bit of um, uh, disagreement amongst people about whether or not we're losing our way by focusing on issues that aren't straight up academic issues, like you know, um, um, school performance outcomes, standardized test scores, um, just the things that have always mattered to us. Because at the end of the day, we actually want literate, numerate children in the world. And it feels like the other team has put us into a corner of talking about the things that are most germane, like the measuring of schools and the measurements, as they put that on trial to the point where now it's just easier for us to work on things that fall within the so-called equity bucket or things that are that um, seem intuitive and make sense, uh, but they also feel like they're more about trying to gain the communities. Um, support of us so that they can work with us on other issues rather than dealing with the main issue, which is, are we graduating kids who can't do anything in the world after, you know, K-12? Do you feel like um, it was a progressive thing to do to add other issues into the pot because that's just a right thing to do, to see a more expansive view of the people you're trying to work with and help? Or do you feel it's it might be a little bit of a distraction to get us off the mark on the things that really matter? So I, I, in in our campaigns, I've seen that it's not a distraction. Um, I think it's good to have a point of view. So I think it's, uh, I don't think we need to be a blank slate. I think we should come and say, you know, we've looked at this and we think these kind of things help kids. But we're also, uh, one of the contributions we're trying to make is to help parents who are often locked out of the system be more powerful and raise their voices. And I think those two things can work together. So there may be some issues that maybe aren't part of the standard 50 can, you know, policy playbook, but in working in specific communities, we find uh, these are things parents care about. And I, I think it's good to champion those. So usually I think that makes our campaign stronger. I think the, the Connecticut example is a good example of that, mm -hmm. um, you know, in Hawaii, where we also have a campaign, um, one of the things we've been working on is making it easier to have internships. Mm. If parents want their kids in high school to be able to have work experience. And it turns out in Hawaii, in order for a business to have a partnership with a high school, it has to register with the state as a vendor 
in order to have an intern. So that, this example is something we wouldn't have thought of, but it, it's important to parents. And so we've been working to remove the red tape. Um, I just want to put this out in the world too. I've been invited to speak to multiple uh, cans in different states. Uh, Hawaii can. Um, I just, um, I'd love to know more about your issues. <laughs> I'd love to come speak to y'all anytime. <laughs> we can maybe um, put that together. I will say Hawaii is a, is a really interesting state. And I think there is, uh, it's beautiful, obviously, and it's a great place to visit, but some really um, big education issues and some exciting innovations. So mm. it's been, we've been really uh, excited to be able to work with the with the team there, and I, I think they are they're very eager to have more people come. And hopefully, as COVID recedes, um, we can all we can all make a visit. All right, we're gonna make this happen. Mm -hmm. So one last headline um, that I wanted to jump into. This one makes a lot of sense to me because it's something that we argue about in activism world, and it's the extent to which people should actually um, be invested in their own the thing that you're trying to help them with. You're not doing it all. They need to be invested in it too, because if they're not, um, um, that's a problem. So this is the headline. If you want people to stay involved, ask them to sacrifice. It's natural to think the best way to keep people involved in your cause is to make it easy for them to take action. However, it is it is the very act of sacrifice that generates a long-term personal commitment to the cause. This one is a little bit um, controversial in activism world because we just think if you know you make it completely free to do everything and you provide a dinner and you provide daycare and you make it easy to um to do the work that that's the way that you're going to get more people involved and um and you even have a lot of people middlemen nonprofit industrial complex people within the communities themselves who are selling that to philanthropy and others as an idea um and they'll of course they'll be the brokers the in between um, the problem with that is that's not the way anybody's organizing anything that really works. I actually um, remember Acorn back in the day um, and um, say what you want about them, about a lot of other things that went on with them. If you just looked at their model, like the poorest of people had to pay $5 a month to participate. What can you afford? You have to pay something, right? Like this isn't a free ride. This isn't. And they would say to you routinely as organizers, I'm not going to solve your problem for you. I will walk with you beside you, but you're going to do the walking. Right. That mentality works so well uh, for the issues that they pushed because those people over time did feel like I actually made an. This isn't charity. This isn't like charity activism. I actually made an investment in this. I'm investing in this and we're going to win. Um, counterintuitive to a lot of the way we organize in, in Ed World. What was the science behind this that you found or what pushed you to this headline? Yeah, so there, you know, there's been a lot of studies. Uh, one of the things that is pretty well studied is why do people stay with social movements? Um, and it's a, you know, it's a kind of exactly what what the headline says that what they found is that in those social movements where you had to do something that a lot was asked of you, um, people were more likely to stay with it. So, like you you mentioned with Acorn, like you have to pay in. You have to show up a certain number of times. You're asked to, you know, do a lot of the work. Um, th those kind of experiences psychologically seem to connect people to to a cause in a deeper way. There's a sense of co-ownership, and the reverse is also true. That when you make it really easy for people, when you break down all the steps and they just have to show up and you know do a couple small things, they tend to bounce off of those groups. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that that's sort of the essence of it, and I, I think it actually applies across a lot of areas. It's not just um, member work and, and volunteer work, but you can also think of that with your own um, boards. Like if you make it so easy, they have to come in, just raise their hand, make a couple votes and go out, rather than asking for donations, asking them to connect you, participating in decisions. You think of that with your partners. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times when we're trying to have partnerships, we try to make it super easy on the partners. Uh, but there's something that happens when people actually share work together uh, that brings them together. Um, so that, this is where I think there, you know, one of the challenges in Ed Reform is very informed, I think, by a mindset of efficiency. Mm -hmm. And there's, mm -hmm. efficiency can be a problem in advocacy. Um, it, you don't, things can't be made too simple, too easy. There has to be a shared struggle to it. Yeah, I love that as a, a point. As we wrap here, um, 
I just want people thinking more about the science behind the work that we do and looking to sources for um, for lessons learned so that we can have more informed activism over time. Um, and we should do some interrogating, like what you just said, like the efficiency problem. I also think scale often becomes the wrong question for many of us. Um, you know, how do you scale this or that and the other? And that's putting the cart before the horse. Maybe you just do the work uh, and have it work and then you you learn some things. Um, as we wrap, Mark, anything that is exciting you in terms of the research that you do and the things that you're you're occupying your mind with right now? Well, you know, one of the big findings when we studied our own data over the past 10 years is that the most effective tactic for getting wins was grassroots organizing. Mm. So I, I feel like um, one thing that's been going in the right direction in ed reform is I think you're seeing more of an attention to genuine grassroots work. Uh, so I'm excited about that. And I will also say, I do feel like we went through a period of hand wringing and sort of woe is me and what went wrong in ed reform. And I think the new generation of people coming up are kind of recommitted to big ideas. And um, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, well, I would love to have your sunny optimism on that, my friend, <laughs> but I still see a lot of the hand wringing. Um, one of the things that attracts me to your work and your product, like what you produce as a person, is that it is um, interesting, research-based, um, philosophical, um, practical. It has all the elements of something like, if I wanted to have a day where I wanted to be effective, I will read Mark Porter McGee. I appreciate that, thank you. See, I was making a point that was so important that they cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> You're uh, praising me. And they yeah. Um, so basically what I was saying is that, um, that we have more than one source of narrative right now in our so-called movement. And a part of that still is hand-wringing. It is still about the, um, my big idea wasn't the one you chose, and that's why we're losing. Um, um, so I appreciate so much more of what you do because I think it's productive, it's research-based, it's practical, it could be used, and it's forward thinking for the field. Like this is what we need more of in our field, forward thinking for the field rather than the, um, the really petty, weird policy battles. I told you guys that wasn't going to work, so you did it anyways. And you know, um, we need less of that. Um, I can't get out of here without saying that Toya Algren, who I told you is a 50 can alumna, uh, still is after me. So she, she says, Mark, uh, we should have a 50 can reunion. Ask him, Chris, please ask <laughs> him. So, um, so I like that idea. I like that idea. I, I think I mean, one of the cool things about 50 can that I've really enjoyed is we've had a, a through a number of, of programs had an opportunity to, to bring some really amazing people together. So I, I love the idea toy of a of reunion, and I think it would be it, it would be a really cool gathering. I think to have everyone in one place. Yeah, I actually meet a lot of fifty can people who consider themselves alumni who I didn't know actually are. Uh, so it comes up and it's like, oh, you guys are everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so Toya, I did my job. I asked, mm -hmm. uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. Hopefully you'll come back as you have anything else to talk about and any more research. Absolutely. Anytime. Well, thank you for having me on, Chris. Um, thanks to everybody who watched, who spent this hour with me every morning. I am always amazed that I have people who love the idea of educating every child so much that they're willing to give mind share, their time. They're willing to come and listen to this program.